I first reported on the digital technology being adopted by the Canadian oil and gas industry about five years ago. And since then, there's been a considerable increase in the adoption of things like, you know, uh, remote sensing, big data and analytics, uh, the cloud, all of that. And I'm going to talk to Jason Cassidy, who's a CEO of Shiny Docs, and he helps oil and gas companies make sense of their data, preparing them for an AI-driven future. I'm kind of curious what that looks like. So welcome to the interview, Jason. Oh, thanks so much for having me, Marco. So what does an AI-driven future look like? Just give us a kind of a brief overview, if you don't mind. Yeah, yeah certainly. It's uh, There's a lot of talk about cool things like a uh, chatbot that can do limericks and stuff like that. And that's that's very cool. But when we talk about AI with respect to oil and gas companies and uh, a lot of other industries, it is really about uh, just saving time and making better decisions. Time is money. If you can get more oil out of the ground, get it in the pipeline, get it through onto a truck and out through to retail faster and less expensive, then obviously that's great. So intelligence itself, which you and I both have, means that we've learned things before. And then when a new situation comes up for us, we infer based upon the data that's there, what the right thing to do is. And that's exactly what artificial intelligence does. If it's seen something before that it can infer what should happen, boom, it makes a decision. And then the computer can start doing some of the work instead of a human. But uh, one of the thing, first things that comes to mind is predictive analytics. So what that means for folks uh, who may be watching and don't know, let's say that you've got a some pumps or something up in one of an oil sands project in northern Alberta, and uh, they fail occasionally. Something goes, a bearing or whatever it is, and the sensors that are there will collect all of that data uh, and be able to spot trends. So if there's some little hinky thing that happens that the, the, the algorithm picks up on, and then it will alert the operator so that a, ma a repair can be done before it becomes a strat catastrophic repair and causes damage down the road. Is this the kind of AI application we're talking about? Yeah, yeah. The unusual vibration reading or the un unusual pressure reading, uh, the model itself, the computer knows what is in band and what's out of band. And when things become out of band, it's either sends an alert or automatically shuts things down. That is the, uh, the that's the primary power of this. And there's a secondary power as well. Uh, when you think about the amount of data that gets collected on it, it, in an oil field, like it's it's huge from everything from where people are moving to how vehicles are moving to what area of the ground is being dug up. Um, it, everything is measured. They have literally measurements for all of this. So to store all of that data as records in case something bad or good happens where, you know, you, you see something good happen, you want to go back and repeat it, or you see something bad happen, an injury or something like that. And then perhaps a legislator will come in and say, tell me everything about those assets or everything about that circumstance. Uh, that's a ton of data. It can be literally billions of data points, which you would end up using up all the storage in the world in order to store that all the time. So they have this recorded history. In comes AI, and we agree that there's two settings. It's either normal right now, or it's out of band. So the AI continually monitoring, now instead of having to say, this is what the reading is all day, the pressure test or the, or the unusual vibration or whatever it is, it just has to say, I'm normal right now. And we record all day today, it was normal, which is a massive savings and a massive efficiency onto itself and something that wasn't really possible before artificial intelligence. What about the potential for AI to replace uh, humans or to make humans far more productive in, uh, you know, like in office jobs? So downtown Calgary is full of office towers that are full of oil and gas companies. And uh, when I was writing a book in 2018, I interviewed uh, the director of innovation for Husky Energy which since been absorbed by Sonovus Energy, in case yeah. anybody doesn't recognize it. And he told me, he said, Markham, we are teaching every employee in our head office, I think it was about 1,200 if I remember correctly, we are teaching them how to use AI software. Because if they can automate some of their tasks or all of their tasks or most of their tasks, we can, we can significantly improve their productivity. And he said, this... Uh, uh, so, you know, 2018, 2019, he said the equivalent here 
is the adoption of Excel 20 years ago. It's that revolutionary in terms of increasing productivity. Is that a good example of, of AI at work? Yeah, the, it's what's interesting is nobody has, uh, you know, a bunch of money in their back pocket to say, Markham, go sell me some AI, here's some money. It is you definitely need to understand what it is that you're trying to to solve. Like, for example, with, with our customers, despite the fact that we do all sorts of cool things with documents and that what we're selling back is time. So when you think of uh, it, when you think of, OK, there is an unusual vibration reading on this particular pump. I'm an engineer. I work in an office. We have procurement people. We work in the office. And the service technician needs to go get the right information to either avoid truck rolls or have the right information when they go there. Well, the old way of doing this would be to call the records manager and pull the paper or have a team's call and collaborate. And it might take 20, 30, 40 hours in order to get all the right control docs and information in order to, to uh, do this fix, send out the technician so that they don't have to redo any of the work. So imagine if you can pre-calculate this, you use artificial intelligence to look at all of your documents and say, I know for sure that this is a work order. I know for sure that this is a pressure test. I know that this one has an engineering seal and here's the signing engineer. That's, you, you can pre-calculate all this stuff. So when the procurement person, the engineer and the person working in the, the, the work order histories, they, when they need to gather the data, data to go and remedy the unusual vibration reading, they can just quickly search for it, like best buy shop for the documents and content, perhaps from Maximo or other systems that they need, because it's already been pre-calculated by AI. It's just, now, it, yeah, it can save you 40 hours down to 40 seconds. Your company, uh, Jason, I'm kind of curious, do you build the software and then customize it for the customer? Or are you a, an applications, you know, where you come in and you take off the shelf applications and then and and then uh, you know adapt it for a, a particular company's requirements. What role does your company play in this process? Yeah, it's it's. I will answer just with your first one that we build the software and then we help customers deploy it for their specific purpose. However, as you know, we all share software. There's lots of um, typical databases. You mentioned even Excel previously. Why would we build something like that? Of course, we inherit all sorts of amazing software from amazing partners and vendors but we build on top of that. So when the customer gets their solution, it's one solution. We don't have any customers that have something truly unique. Everybody gets the same thing, but then they extend it for their own rules a little bit different because somebody might be using it for procurement. Somebody might be using it for legal holds. Other people might be using it for predictive analytics. So the implementations are slightly different, but the overall tasks to do it, every AI project starts with data preparation. It's the hardest part. It's the most expensive part and the most lossy part. So we automate that part. We go find the information that you need so that humans don't have to. And we match it up with your structured data so that humans don't have to. And now you create your AI models out of that. So it, it gets rid of the hardest part of AI. And then, of course, that's now, now we got a predictive model where we can decide whether or not we need to do a truck roll. That's cool but it's up to the customer to make those decisions. They know their engineering better than we do. So we can only take it so far before then the engineers go, okay, I got it from here. Well, Jason, this is fascinating. I really appreciate this. Thank you. Yeah, my pleasure, Markham. Thanks, Thanks for having me.